Hello, everyone. We are going to get started now. Welcome to the Columbia School of Social Work Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month um, online panel uh, hosted by the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office. Uh, my name is Chris Wan, he, them pronouns. Um, I am uh, speaking to you on Lenape lands. Um, really grateful to be able to do that. And I have um, short black hair in the form of hair, um, beard, and mustache. I'm also wearing a traditional Korean garb known as the hanbok. And I'm using a virtual background um, of the demilitarized zone in Korea, which is my ancestral homelands. So before we get started, I would like to pass it off to um, Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Community Engagement, Karma Lode for the introductions. Thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Karma Lode. I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Community Engagement at the School of Social Work. As a visual descriptor, uh, I am a Black woman with uh, mocha chocolate colored skin. I'm wearing uh, some small square rimmed glasses that are tortoise shell colored. Uh, I have curly hair that's pulled back in a ponytail and showing off my nice little streak of white. <laughs> Welcome to our, uh, our panel discussion today. We're gonna get started with a, um, a land acknowledgement and then and a few other logistical matters. And then I'm gonna pass the mic back to Chris to, to kick us off with the panel. Wanishi, Kamsamimida, and thank you to the Lenape peoples whose ancestral and unceded lands I am able to be a guest on and share the space with you all here today in commemorating Asian Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian Heritage Month. A land acknowledgement recognizes both indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and also the relationships that indigenous peoples hold with their ancestral and unceded lands, the observance of which both raises awareness to and also demands us to take actions on the issues of ongoing colonization, lack of repatriation, stolen graves, cultural appropriation, erasure of time memorial existence of two spirit and third gender traditions, displacement, destruction of sacred sites, traditional diets and languages or forcibly put to sleep as expressed in some communities, forced assimilation, intergenerational trauma, health disparities, disproportionate incarceration rates and more. Wherever the space may be that we occupy, we hold ourselves accountable to remember to thank and to build solidarity to actively dismantle all oppressive systems. And in a moment, we'll post a link in the chat box. And this link is a way for us to take small steps towards action to support the removal of colonizer memorials and the return of stolen goods and to give the indigenous land taxes in your local areas. Ask permission from and listen to and learn of the histories of the indigenous communities of your respective locales. So our panel objective today is for collaboration among various identities to share and honor alternative counter authentic narratives to the dominant narratives that perpetuate the stigmatization sorry, and oppression of Asian Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian identifying folks and or folks whose indigenous lands have been politicized to be part of the API narrative. And then pass the mic back to Chris to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Karma, for that introduction. I am extremely humbled and excited for the panel that we have today. Um, once again, it is a celebration of our identities um, here. I'm going to begin with introductions um, after which each panelist will give a visual descriptor of themselves. First up, Hina Le Moana, KK Wang Kalu, who also identifies as Kanaka Maoli. Hina Le Moana Wang Kalu is a Kanaka Maoli native Hawaiian teacher, cultural practitioner, and community leader. Born in the New Uanu district of Oahu, Kumu Hina was educated at Kamehameha schools and the University of Hawaii. She was a founding member, member of Kulia Na Mamo, a community organization established to improve the quality of life for Mahu Wahine, transgender women, and served for 13 years as a director of culture at a Honolulu public charter school dedicated to using Native Hawaiian culture, history, and education as tools for developing and empowering the next generation of warrior scholars. 
Kumuhina is, a cur is currently a cultural advisor and leader in many community affairs and civic activities, including chair of the Oahu Island Burial Council, which oversees the management of Native Hawaiian burial sites and ancestral remains. In 2014, Hina announced her bid for a position on the board of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, one of the first transgender candidates to run for statewide political office in the United States. Hina is married to Hema Kalu from Niuafo Island in the Kingdom of Tonga. They live together in Nu'uanu, Honolulu. Thank you for being here. Kumu Hina, would you mind giving a visual descriptor of yourself? Aloha everyone and thank you for this opportunity to be here. A physical descriptor of me, um, I am olive skinned with uh, uh, I used to have really long hair, but now it's a little bit shorter, but it's still in a bun on my head. And I am wearing a black t-shirt uh, dressed uh, rather comfortably for our Zoom engage today. And uh, well, what can I say? Um, I think that'll suffice for physically describing myself. And I'm known to have a very low voice. Um, and so it's rather distinct, I've been told. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you so much for being here with us. Next up, we have Laden Tetong. Laden Tetong is co-founder and director of the Tibet Action Institute, where she leads a team of technologists and human rights activists, advocates, excuse me, in developing and advancing open source communication technologies, nonviolent strategies, and innovative training programs for Tibetans and other groups facing heavy repression. A visionary strategist, she has spent two decades building a powerful nonviolent movement for Tibet's freedom and driving innovative economic and political campaigns to counter China's rule in Tibet. She previously served as executive director of students for a free Tibet from 2002 to 2009, where she led the high profile global campaign to condemn China's rule of Tibet in the lead up to and during the 2008 Olympic games. Tetong made international headlines as she posted real-time accounts of her travels through Beijing on her blog, BeijingWideOpen.org, one of the first in the Tibetan world before being detained and deported. Laden was awarded the first ever James Lawson Award for Nonviolent Achievement by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict in 2011 and currently serves as co-chair of the International Tibet Network, the global coalition of Tibet-related non-governmental organizations. Welcome. Would you mind please giving a visual descriptor? Thank you very much. Hi and Tashitele uh, is a greeting in Tibetan. Um, so my visual descriptor is uh, I have what looks like red skin right now, brown skin, um, uh, brown hair with lots of gray in it now, uh, big black rimmed glasses. Uh, I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt. I have a tattoo uh, on my arm that is a Tibetan independence rung zam bracelet. And I'm sitting in front of a green, um, abstract painting on a yellow wall um, that was a painting done by a, a Tibetan artist, uh, a friend of my mother. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Next up, we have Lydia XZ Brown. Lydia XZ Brown is an advocate, educator, and attorney addressing state and interpersonal violence targeting disabled people living at the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality, faith, language, and nation. Lydia is policy counsel for privacy and data at the Center for Democracy and Technology, focused on algorithmic discrimination and disability, as well as director of policy, advocacy, and external affairs at the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. They are founding director of the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic People of Color's Interdependence, Survival, and Empowerment. Lydia is adjunct lecturer and core faculty in Georgetown University's Disability Study Pro Studies Program and adjunct professorial lecturer in American Studies at American University's Department of Critical Race, Gender, and Culture Studies. They serve as a commissioner on the American Bar Association's Commission on Disability Rights, chairperson of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Section's Disability Rights Committee, 
board co-chair of the Disability Rights Bar Association and representative for the Disability Justice Committee to the National Lawyers Guild's National Executive Committee. Lydia is currently creating their own tarot deck, Disability Justice Wisdom Tarot. They have received many awards and much acclaim, as well as many rejection letters and much hate mail. Often their most important work has no title, job description, or funding, and probably never will. Lydia, would you mind giving a visual descriptor of yourself? This is Lydia. I'm a youngish East Asian person with short black hair and rectangular glasses, wearing a dark shirt against a blurred background that is a wood paneled room and some pictures hanging up on the pictures hanging up on the wall. And uh, there's a lot of light behind me. There's not actually light in front of me because those light bulbs died, unfortunately. And so you're, you're stuck with the vaguely not perfect zoom silhouette instead. I'm wearing a bracelet that says, today I will not give a fuck. And I normally have two rings, one of which says fuck in very dainty cursive. And the other of which is rainbow, teal and purple spinny. And that's my wedding ring. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. And last but not least is Sonali Rashatwar. Sonali Rashatwar, licensed clinical social worker and master of education is an award-winning clinical social worker, sex therapist, adjunct lecturer, and grassroots organizer. Based in Philly, licensed in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, she is a super fat, queer, bisexual, non-binary therapist and co-owner of Radical Therapy Center, specialized in treating sexual trauma, body image issues, racial or immigrant identity issues, and South Asian family systems, while offering fat and body positive sexual health care. Popularly known as the Fat Sex Therapist on Instagram, their notoriety first peaked when they were featured on Breitbart in March 2018 for naming thinness as a white supremacist beauty ideal. And they continue to draw the ire of white supremacists everywhere with controversial statements on intersectional fat liberation since then. Sonali is a sought after speaker who travels internationally to curate custom visual workshops that whisper to our change making spirit and nourish our vision for a more just future. Sonali is not paid for her labor as a community organizer where she has fundraised and facilitated a free five day political action summer camp for LGBT plus South Asian and Indo Caribbean youth. Sonali received their Master of Social Work and Master of Education in Human Sexuality from Widener University in 2016 and have been working in the field of anti-violence for eight plus years. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Sonali and to offer a visual description, I am a young-ish, light-skinned, Indian, non-binary, butch person and I'm wearing a light gray sweater dress that is keeping me warm in the early spring in Philadelphia. And I have a backdrop of some of my favorite plants behind me and they help keep me grounded. So there's green and uh, different color planters like tan and white and they're hanging with macrame. I have a short haircut that looks kind of masculine. I have curly black hair and I'm wearing a pair of plastic uh, see-through glasses. Welcome. So today's conversation for audience members is on identity, belonging, history, and activism. Um, and we really wanted to try to be intentional about um, um, having folks from various identities and backgrounds um, share their wisdoms with our community members. And we really wanna appreciate you all for being here. The conversations are going to be organic. So although I am the moderator, um, if any of the panelists would like to jump in or expand on anyone else's uh, comments or question one another, please feel free to do so. But I will start um, off with our first question um, and I can direct it at Sonali if that's okay for you um, to get us just started um, is on identity. Our identities impact so much of the work that we do and the ways in which we perceive the world. What communities are you rooted in and how do your identities inform your work? I am a super fat Indian American person who has survived sexual violence and diet trauma in my lifetime. And that directly informs the person that I am 
in, on social media and in my clinical work. So I work as a therapist and I also offer popular education through the platform Instagram to popularize concepts around internalized fat phobia and casteism and trying to make broader connections to concepts around colonialism. And uh, my lived experiences directly impact that. Uh, that comes from being put on non-consensual diets as a young person, starting around ages uh, nine and 10, which catapulted me to become someone who wanted to make the world safer for fat people. Um, my identities directly impact the communities that I'm rooted in. I'm rooted in rad radical leftist South Asian organizing spaces. I am rooted in spaces that are that speak similar language that, that I grew up around, like Marathi and Hindi, and even languages that weren't spoken in my home, like Gujarati or Urdu. And um, a, a lot of my lived experiences lend to where I feel most comfortable. Do any of you all uh, feel similarly about the way that you find yourself rooted in communities based on your lived experiences? I'm going to take a stab at, at answering that question in an effort to also address uh, the way I perceive my world. Um, quite truthfully, this entire engage is an absolutely steep learning curve for me because I am not exposed to this kind of articulation of everything from who we are to describing ourselves to um, the way even you yourself, uh, Sonali, have um, uh, started to share. And, and sort of like I, I'm on a periphery of, uh, of knowing and, and having um, been part of certain conversations, but this is rather new. So um, for me, I am but one Kanaka, and Kanaka is the term that my people use for Native Hawaiian. I am but one Kanaka in my homeland, which continues to be illegally occupied by the United States of America. With that said, the generational trauma that my people have continued to endure and have suffered greatly from. And when I say suffer, it is so insidious that my people don't even realize, many of them, that that is what is going on. And many of my people cannot see beyond the imposed sense of being. It's pretty much that they would be quick to acknowledge being American first rather than Kanaka. So um, I am not someone who can identify or, or wishes to identify as an American anything. I am required to hold an American passport when I travel. However, I am Kanaka, I am Native Hawaiian. My allegiance politically will always be to my homeland first and foremost. It, my people have a nasty habit of saying the mainland without even thinking about that word mainland. And I am in my mainland. When I travel to the continental United States, that is what I have learned to be the land of the great turtle. And it is home to many, many native peoples whom are akin to us in the Pacific. But even that gets problematic because here, in this uh, forum, we are lumped together with Asian and Pacific Islander. It is a way to me, no offense to anyone here, but it is a way to herd us and corral us into the discussion spaces and into the inner network of feeding at the US uh, grain trough that many of us uh, are forced to go to. Um, so with that, I can only say that my view is from Hawaii is my mainland 
and it affects everything I do. It affects everything I say. It it roots me and ground me grounds me in being Kanaka first. Uh, it is something of a more Western and foreign construct to view myself within the LGBTQI format. However, I am able to engage in it. And as you can see, um, the term Mahu there next to my name, um, it is our term for what you, you might all um, be more familiar with as a two-spirited or, or multiple-spirit individual. Um, but you see, therein lies uh, another element to us as Pacific Islanders. We are, we are whom we are. We are the, the child of so-and-so, our parents. We are the grandchildren of our grandparents. And I come from this place called Pu'unui in Nu'uanu Valley on the island of Oahu. Um, these are the ways that we identify ourselves. And so we don't identify ourselves by pro, um, pronouns and we don't identify ourselves by sex or sexuality. Um, so that's, that's a bit of my experience. If I could um, uh, allow that to serve as my intro to being with you all today. This is just extremely stimulating. Thank you very much. Your share was also very stimulating. Hello. This is Lydia. I'm really loving Sonali's cat. There's a beautiful gray, black looking cat on screen, flicking a tail. I love that cat. That cat is wonderful. Hello. Hi, beautiful one. You are gorgeous. You are. You are the bestest. I love you. Hi. Hi. Hi, wonderful floof. You are the best. All cats are best cat. That is science. That was absolutely in no way whatsoever a response to the question that we were asked. For me, my identities have always been shaped both by my own sense of who I am and my interactions in a world that presumes what people are supposed to be like, what people are supposed to look like, who people are, are supposed to be and the ways in which I do not match and cannot assimilate into those expectations. Part of my experiences is not part of my bio. And um, I've gone back and forth for many years as an organizer over whether or not to name identities that I hold in the bios that I give and ask to be read at events like this. And um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, and I'm not the first and I won't be the last person to name this, but in many spaces where, we're, where we name oppression and domination and colonization and are speaking about community power, about intersectionality, about collective liberation, we tend to have an expectation that we will lead only with our marginalized identities. And even that notion of identity, like Hina Leamwana was just saying when she was speaking, is also tricky because the way that we think of identity is also often within a colonial construct within a white Western notion of a static label or category that a person falls into that therefore is definitive and determinative of various aspects of their life. And in many of our own cultures and forms of ancestral knowledge and wisdom and relationship to ourselves and to our communities, that specific notion of identity doesn't necessarily match. Um, that's one reason. Another reason why I've struggled with that is because when we only name and center our marginalized identities, we do that for an important reason, which is to call attention to and fight back against erasure of our communities, our identities, who we are, where we come from, by saying, I am here. I am present as a transmasculine, non-binary, agender, genderqueer, neurodivergent, multiply disabled, East Asian, transracial and transnational adoptee from China. Right? I can name those aspects of my experience as a way of fighting against the erasure of people who share my experiences or identities. But the problem in doing that is that I can fail to capture the ways in which each of us may also be navigating through at least conditional and precarious forms of privilege. For example, the fact that all of us are able to communicate in English, a colonizing language, and the dominant one of this country right now. 
we are all able to communicate in English. We are all able to access the internet for this virtual event. And that is a privilege that many of our community members do not have, especially impoverished, colonized, oppressed, black, brown, native, and disabled people worldwide do not have that same level of access. And so the question in, when you read our bio, right, do we name our marginalized identities? And if we do, do we also have a responsibility to name the ways in which we are navigating and experiencing, however conditional it may be, some forms of privilege, access, and resources, even from within the communities that we come from? But to that first point, that when we talk about identity and how our identities are shaped or are formed, that is tricky. As someone who survived the transracial, transnational adoption industrial complex, it is difficult for me to talk about what an identity is, about my race, my ethnicity, my culture. I am a Chinese American based upon a definition that centers United States nationhood and illegal colonial government that occupies lands of literally hundreds of native peoples. I am an East Asian person defining my origin based upon where in the world I am from and centering Asia in that notion as opposed to using terms that center white Western European ways of understanding and describing the world and its geography. But neither of those terms fully capture my positionality as somebody who at the same time is displaced, a form of migrant, but not an immigrant, not undocumented, not a refugee, not a descendant of somebody who is enslaved, not someone who's indigenous to this land, and not a settler in the same way as white people or the descendants of white people who chose to occupy this land. But at the same time, I've occupied a settler role because I continue to live as an uninvited guest on lands that I'm not from. I live on, 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 on unceded and occupied Piscataway land. That's not where I am from. Those are not my people, it's not my ancestry. And at the same time, if I were to go back, quote unquote, to China, that is a huge, also colonial empire nation. And I don't know, where, where am I from to map that, right? Where am I actually from? That is a nation that, and, and led on your work literally has challenged China's occupation of Tibet, right? That col China colonizes Tibet, Turkestan, in many other areas within its control. What is my relationship to colonialism as being someone removed from the nation that I, where I was born and brought to another settler colonial state? What is my identity as someone who moves through the world as multiply disabled? At times, both literally having that part of my identity denied, erased, ignored, invalidated, and delegitimized, and yet it affects every waking moment of my life to be disabled in the different ways that I am disabled, as autistic, as psych disabled, as cognitively disabled, and at the same time as someone who moves through the world with any manner of abled privilege. I'm a hearing and sighted and ambulatory person, which is why so many people might think, oh, well, you're not really disabled, you don't count. And yet ableism has been a driving force of violence against me and in many communities that I've been part of. To talk about identity is very tricky because it assumes a static relationship that always stays the same. When our relationships to who we are and the people around us are always affected by geography, are always affected by culture, are always affected by the shifting tides and turns of empire, of occupation, of const constructs of race and of nation and of ability, of class, of caste, of normativity. Where it makes sense for me to be known as and understood as queer is not always the case. It's not universal. A queer experience is not a universal one. Neither is a disabled experience. And yet, the work that I do rooted and grounded in a practice of disability justice, which itself is a framework created by black and brown and queer and trans disabled people, understands that disability is part of all of our struggles for freedom and liberation, that ableism is part of all systems of domination and oppression, 
if only because of the ways in which systems of settler colonialism and racialized capitalism and settler colonialism literally serve to create and exacerbate disability. I also, this is the first time I've ever done a visual descriptor um, and I've given many, many talks and I think that's crazy and sad, but also amazing that I got to do it for the first time here. Um, I have not been so um, out in the outside world lately, not just because of the pandemic, but because I have three uh, small, beautiful children and um, I have been at home with them uh, for a while. I had a son before, um, so I actually have four, uh, three living and one not. And uh, after um, a long time, running around the world and doing, uh, being very privileged to work for the Tibetan people. I have been uh, more in my home and in my family, uh, immediate family life. And that has been an incredible privilege uh, and journey of its own. Um, I, uh, so my father is uh, from Tibet. I have never uh, been to Tibet because of China's illegal occupation. Um, my mother is white Canadian from Wales, England. That's her background. And um, she's also never been to Tibet, but she went to India for 12 years uh, and lived in the Tibetan refugee community. Um, and that's where my parents met. That's how I came to be. Um, and so I have this strange life where I am Tibetan, but I've never been to Tibet. Um, I'm Canadian, as I, as I always said in my life, but I was not, I'm not um, First Nations. Um, I grew up on the west coast of Canada on Vancouver Island um, and spent my life explaining, uh, you know, answering the question, where are you from? And I would say I was born in Royal Jubilee Hospital. But if you're asking me why I'm not white, you know, which was the question always, then my father is from Tibet. I am Tibetan. I'm Tibetan Canadian. That came much later. Um, the way, you know, the Asian American um, label is not one that I've uh, identified with for obvious reasons because I wasn't, I wasn't, um, raised here. I have lived here for a long time though, but in Canada, really there was no, when I was growing up, there was, I'm 45. So there was just, I was, you were either Canadian, which meant what, I don't know, or you were, you know, for me, it was that you were first nations person. You were a white Canadian or we were visible minorities. That's just the way that was the term that was used to describe um, anybody, I guess, who wasn't white and that was it. So, um, but I was and am lucky to have a very loving, politically active family that took me to um, protest my parents when I was, from the time my brother and sister and I were very young, we, you know, from the time I was in a stroller, we were outside the Chinese consulate in Vancouver with our tiny Tibetan community protesting China's occupation of Tibet and calling for a free Tibet uh, in a part of the world where we, I mean, I know people just had absolutely no idea who we were, or what we stood for. There were some, but not many. And uh, I traveled with my parents as they gave talks about Tibet and a lot of fundraising and trying to get, um, aid for Tibetan refugees in India, that was kind of, that was my life. And I knew that, you know, I'm the youngest of three children and I just, all three of us felt very strongly that Tibet should be free, that my, um, my father's two sisters, all of our cousins there, that we should know them, that my father should be allowed to go there. And uh, dinner's, dinner conversation at our house was, not like anyone else on our street. We, um, I remember at one time coming out of the, like in the early eighties, 
dinner conversation at our table was if you're a kid in Tibet and you talk too much, you might get your parents thrown in prison if you, if you say things that show that you believe in um, anything other than what the Chinese Communist Party believes is the true history of Tibet, that is Tibet belongs to China. If you believe in the Dalai Lama, Tibet, most of Tibetan's political spiritual leader, if you believe in the Dalai Lama, if you believe in a free and independent Tibet, if you say those things outside the home, you can get your whole family um, in trouble. And so I remember wrestling with these ideas and debating this with my parents as, as a child at the dinner table, whether I would do that because I talked a lot and whether I would get us all in trouble if, if we were in Tibet. And just, you know, um, I had a grandmother in Vancouver, uh, who not, you know, a grandmother, not my direct grandmother, but still we all called her grandmother and she was a relative. Um, and I remember when her children, five children that were left behind in Tibet that she got separated from at the time of the great Tibetan uprising in 1959, um, when most Tibetans um, that ended up in India at that time escaped about 80,000. My grandmother, who hasn't seen her children for or heard of them for decades, was getting news of little bits of news of who was alive, who had been seen, who was in prison, who what, you know, and just this idea that, you know, how do I explain this to my friends? How I, I tried, I always tried. My friends tell me that now I was always doing this, um, trying to talk about what was happening in Tibet and fight for justice in any way that I could, even if all that meant was telling somebody what was happening and, and educating them that China, you know, was, Tibet did not belong to China, that Tibet was an independent nation under illegal occupation and what illegal occupation even meant to kids at call it elementary school or wherever I was in, um, in Canada. So, uh, yeah, you speak of privilege, I feel, I've done this work now, um, uh, activism, advocacy for Tibet for two decades, a little over two decades. And I feel so unbelievably uh, privileged to do it. And to, I'd never got, you know, I have I, my, my two, my father's two sisters have both passed away now in Tibet. My father has Alzheimer's and he's losing his memory uh, and, and, Actually, he remembers Tibet. It's the interesting thing of all. He can't necessarily remember who we are, but he remembers his childhood and his life in Tibet. And um, uh, the work I do now is about, you know, Tibetans inside Tibet who face every single day the, you know, right now, though not in the headlines, the most unimaginable suffering, indignities, racism, uh, torture, abuse, and prison, all of it, and still resist. Young people going into the street to protest in, really, you could look at it as a futile act because um, they are no match. They're unarmed and they go into the street and they literally raise their fist for freedom for Tibet. They'll say independence for Tibet or long live the Dalai Lama and you know China out of Tibet. They'll say those things in Tibetan in the streets and they don't, they, they last like five minutes, 10 minutes, if that, before they're stopped. Um, and then they, yeah, they go to prison, they disappear. They may be, they may be given a trial, maybe not for a year. Uh, one young, one young uh, monk, 19 years old, uh, sort of went in and out of prison for over a year and then eventually was um, returned to his his family was informed he was in a hospital and there, there he, he died of his torture um, in January. So, you know, these are kids who do not remember a free and independent Tibet. They don't know life other than under the Chinese um, government control, but they still believe and they risk everything. And so what I do is try to give voice to um, to tell their stories, to, to spread the word and to challenge um, China's illegal occupation to bet at every turn and everywhere we can. 
because uh, the one thing I've learned from Tibetans inside Tibet over all these years, right from my dad's, you know, my childhood and my dad and mom, their influence on me, my grandmother's, it's just that the resistance is strong and it just passes from generation to generation. And the, the paradox of repression, the more repression there is in Tibet, the greater the resistance. And I, um, I do see an end. I do believe it's possible. I know it's not easy, um, but Tibetans inside don't give up. So I, that's not even an option for me or for most of, of um, my family and friends and community. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's a, I guess my best way of saying who I am and what I do or why I do it. I wanted to add one thing, you use the word futile, but to me, it, it, it helps to, it helps me to see how fragile these nation, these nation states are and these false occupations that a protester can't even stand out there for 10 minutes. It's so weak that we are resistance because right, you can't, you could kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill a revolution as Fred Hampton says. Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdoms um, and your stories. Uh, I really am humbled to be in presence with you all, um, truly. And I know that some of you may have touched upon this already and um, I want to continue on the topic of um, what identity means as it pertains to belongingness, um, especially. Um, and Lydia, I especially appreciate uh, you uh, touching upon like the complexities of what identities might mean for some folks, um, for sure. So right now in the world, I mean, uh, a society of occupations, illegal occupation, um, colonization, war, separation, migration, um, or indigeneity based on um, where your communities might be. So to you all, um, my question for you is, what does belongingness mean to you, um, either in your respective communities or just in general? Um, once again, what does belongingness mean to you all? And any one of you could uh, start off the conversation. I'd like to tackle that. Oh, um, my father is Chinese and my mother is Hawaiian um, and mix of Portuguese, English, ethnicity. So my two predominant identities are Hawaiian and Chinese. And Hawaiian I view as a part of a larger uh, connectivity to other Polynesians that the world knows as Tongan, you know, people from Tonga, Samoa, Tahiti, Aotearoa. <clears throat> we have a, a much larger, um, expansive uh, population <clears throat> of people who share language and culture and uh, a profound <clears throat> thought that I had listening to everybody here is, and as it pertains to this question, um, that belonging, I think it's imperative for us to consider how much or how little we will allow our politics, our political views to influence whom we actually are. Um, for example, uh, for Lydia, you mentioned about your, you know, being a, a descendant of, of China. Am I correct? Um, my father. Yes. Um, I was born in China and then I was taken from China when I was still a baby. Yes. And so, so therein lies a great dilemma because politically um, I see what China does in the world and we all see it. Um, listening to uh, Ladon in, you know, in your situation. Um, but the, the cultural element that I understand to the homeland of my, my father's side of the family <clears throat> begets uh, the, the discussion of a very different China and a very different sense of family. I was welcomed by my family. Having, having been someone who did not have connectivity to the homeland of my father's side of the family. For me to journey there to Zongsan 
and and to go to my grandmother's village and to to see my family's photos on the wall my father and and you know it, it's been from my great grandfather's time that uh, our family's not been connected to so to see the actual photo of my father and my grandmother um on the wall because it was taken by a family member who connected with them literally brought me to my knees and i was welcomed on the basis of a shared culture despite the fact that i am not able to converse in the cantonese uh, dialect of of china um i still understood enough to to enable me to connect and um <clears throat> so you know i i think about what we're sharing here and i have less of an issue to acknowledge that i am of chinese heritage because i understand what that means when it comes to the relationship of child to parent as a caregiver for my family um how we treat our ancestors or at least how our how my culture at one time treated them um for so many years i i devoted my attention to being hawaiian i denied my identity as someone of chinese descent and it was really hard growing up in a predominantly asian um neighborhood this entire area if if i thought that i'd have an opportunity to politically influence my home here i'd have to move out of the neighborhood that i grew up in because whereas i've always been in the middle for all kinds of things in this case i would not be asian enough i would not be chinese enough to sway them imagine <clears throat> imagine not being hawaiian enough because of the trappings of the bureaucracy and administrative hoops and hurdles that are pre presented to us i don't have enough blood quantum to be eligible for land that is set aside for my people as a hawaiian and yet my fellow hawaiians don't always look at me as a uh, full-blooded hawaiian either because i'm fairer than some my hair is straighter than others my skin is lighter than other hawaiians and then on the other side i am i am far too dark and far too tall and far too big to be uh to just disappear into my chinese side of the family and into that sector of the community i stick out like a sore thumb so a sense of belonging really <clears throat> i believe is intrinsically incumbent upon us to to the best of our ability know at least some basic tenets that are found in our language they're found in our our customary practices and that can help us to make those bridges because when the politics divides us all what do we have to rely on to pull us back to a sense of that commonality to ground us and to root us in that which will sustain us in the next generation to come anyway my 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 thoughts for you all when i think about belonging i think about a feeling i think about what it might feel like because i haven't yet experienced it and this is a similar thought process that i go through when i imagine what abolition might feel like or what when i imagine what revolution might feel like. And so some of the feelings that I imagine belonging feels like, because I do get a taste of it sometimes. I'd get a taste of that belonging feeling when I'm at my best friend's house and she's feeding me uh, like a her traditional Bangladeshi potato breakfast with like roti and prata, uh, like spiced potatoes and like a, an over easy egg, it's delicious. And I, and so some of the feelings that I feel when I feel like I'm belonged I'm belonging somewhere is like safety. I feel freedom. 
I feel, and I feel no shame. I feel like the ability to expand and like take up space. To me, that's what I know. That's what I know I'm, when I'm feeling belonging. This is Lydia. I want roti and parata now. I just said this. In the chat. <laughs> I will make you some post pandemic when it's safe to be like in the same location. I will make you some. I totally will. I will feed them to you. They're probably not going to be as good as like, you know, your families, but like, they'll, they'll still be filled with love just from not family. Lydia, you're so sweet. <laughs> I've also been working on making more dishes from Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So I will share, I will offer uh, for the capture that's spelled T-A-M-I-L-N-A-D-U and K-E-R-R-A-L-A. I've actually never felt real belonging anywhere personally. And I've written about this in a few different places and I've spoken about it in many others. And kind of like what you just were saying, I've occasionally felt glimpses of what belonging could be like, but I don't think I've ever really experienced that. I write fiction. I've been writing fiction for my entire life. I'm working on my seventh novel right now. None of them have been published, but I dream one day that they will be. And one thing that I've noticed about all of my characters in my novels, in my short fiction, and even in my tabletop role-playing games, all of my characters are deeply lonely people, every single one of them. The characters that are more sympathetic and the characters that are less sympathetic, the characters who uphold and embody a lot of forms of power and privilege, and the characters that experience compounded marginalization and oppression. They all are lonely, lonely people. And I noticed that when I was thinking and looking even through my writing from when I was as young as three years old when I started writing fiction. All of my characters have always been deeply lonely people who never really fit in. Some of them are respected by other people around them and others are not, but almost none of them really have many, if any, close friends or community connections. When they belong to a community, they are at the fringe or the margins of that community. When they have friends, those friends are extraordinarily loyal to them, but there's like two of them, maybe. And again, like some people don't have any friends, right? Two might be a lot. But I've noticed that that is the one common thread among all of them. They're very deeply lonely people. And I think that that has been, I don't just think, you know, I know. That has been a reflection of my own experience that I've moved through the world constantly feeling that I live in this liminal space. Like Gloria Ansault Dua wrote about this as the borderlands. And while of course the experiences that I embody are not the same as the ones that she did, I feel very similarly that I live in the spaces in between in every community and space that I am in. And sometimes, ironically, the very communities that I should be able to say, this is where I belong, like queer and trans people of color community, or autistic and broader neurodivergent community, or a community of ex-evangelicals, people who survived spiritual abuse from fundamentalist Christianity. No matter what community we're talking about, I will often always feel that I have a connection, but I don't fully belong. I don't feel at home. I feel alienated. I feel isolated. I feel disconnected. And I think part of that is a product of having been and adopted both transracially and transnationally. That is across national borders and into a family of a different race, ethnicity, and culture than the one I came from. But part of it is also just living in the world as a queer, trans, and disabled person. Living in a world that is profoundly white supremacist and settler colonial as a person of color born in a nation that at, 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 on the one hand is considered self globally and is also its own empire at the same time. And that leaves me as an individual without a home. 
metaphorically speaking, right? That I mean, the closest thing I can find to home, at least in understanding, is among other disabled queer and trans people of color. But I still don't feel that I have, this is a community where I fully belong. I don't think I've ever had that feeling. Yeah, sometimes I, that feeling is very elusive to me in both. I think that, that where I feel the greatest sense of belonging is with, you know, at, at home in my body and who, how, who, exactly who I am is um, with my Tibetan and non-Tibetan activist friends. Um, and I say that because I am, so I, to most Tibetans, um, now people know who I am, so they know I'm Tibetan, but most Tibetans would never ever look at me and think I was Tibetan. I don't, I am a very large female, tall, um, not Tibetan looking person. And um, I remember when I used to like go to India and go into Tibetan refugee community there and go into a store, go somewhere. And I would listen to people talk about me. They, I mean, they had no, when I would say go into a store or a restaurant, just no idea that I had any Tibetan um, heritage. Uh, and so I don't know, it's weird to be Tibetan, but not have no one think you're Tibetan or have no one think I'm Tibetan. And then to be in the, in the world I grew up in, which was really very white Canada and to be constantly being asked where I was from and what I was, and then describe myself as Tibetan. And then to, to, I, it's just, a, it's a strange in between and culture, you know, talking about honoring culture and being connected to culture. It's something that I um, feel so deeply. It's really painful for me, actually, because the very, you know, China's invasion of occupation and occupation of Tibet is what led to my existence, you know, to my parents meeting in refu a refugee camp. Uh, and being raised in on Vancouver Island in Canada was as far away from there from Tibet as you could get on the one hand as I could get on the one hand and so my you know my my obviously my father speaks Tibetan fluently my mother speaks Tibetan fluently because of all the years that she was there um, in in India but my brother and sister and I did not I mean we did we spent most of our time with people who weren't Tibetan. There was one um, on Vancouver Island, there was one monk when we were growing up, Gishila, who was our uh, dear family friend. And that was it. We were the Tibetan community at that time. Um, we would go to Vancouver, Seattle to be with Tibetans for Losa or Tibetan New Year's or for protests or for some big you know, weddings, whatever. And that was an occasion. So, so, I did not live in the Tibetan world and Tibetan culture. I was just like a, you know, a sort of strange um, kid in college, British Columbia. And, um, but, and then now to be so, this is my, you know, I'm, I, life's work is to just constantly be working for Tibet, but I'm kind of outspoken. I am, I don't have very many traditional characteristics at all. Culturally, I don't, you know, I maybe can be too pushy. I don't know. People really, I, I, I can feel the disapproval from elders or from, especially when I was, when I was working, organizing out of New York for a long time, I could feel that I didn't belong. Um, I overcame it. I think the thing that always like, I don't know, propels me forward is that in the end, you know, I feel so connected to the 
struggle for justice. And that is, has gotten me through difficult times and wanting to crawl out of my own skin in certain situ many situations of, of um, you know, feeling like I didn't belong or that I wasn't, you know, whatever the word is, like there's a thing that happens. I, my husband uh, who's Tibetan also grew up in um, an international school in England from the age of eight, he was separated from his family in India. He was supposed to be, you know, the lucky one who got the opportunity to go to school in England. He was just, he was traumatized at a young age from eight till I don't think he saw his parents again for four or five years on that first separation. But he had this, you know, on some level, this incredible life. But he also had this thing that he, he and I both, we talk about it where the idea is, you know, good Tibetan, his, the home um, mothers would do this with him. And my dad would do this with us. Certainly sometimes, you know, good Tibetan kids don't do this. And good Tibetan kids, you know, wouldn't this or that. And so you kind of think, oh, I'm really not a good kid or person. You know, that's not what they intend, but that's what happens. Uh, and you get scolded for losing your culture, but then that's just what happens. So I work very, I have worked very hard to try to reclaim on my terms, my language, culture with my children. I see how magical it is and I want it to be for them. And I think of this for Tibetans inside Tibet, like I've always had such positive um, associations with being Tibetan in the big sense. And then Tibetans inside Tibet, I'll never forget seeing uh, this film that was done clandestinely in Tibet because you can't do it openly because people would go to prison. And I saw some young Tibetan university students from Eastern Tibet. And they had just seen a message, a recorded message that um, someone had taken of the Dalai Lama speaking about the strength of Tibetan culture and spirit. And the, they watch the clip and it ends and they're so quiet. And then this one young man says, that was the first time I've heard words in our favor. I'll never forget that feeling of, I mean, I would say that was a 20, early 20s man in his early 20s that was the first time he heard a positive association with being Tibetan. Because in Tibet and in sort of the Chinese government view of Tibetans and, and unfortunately Chinese society because of the, of the political, you know, the propaganda, Tibetans are sort of backwards, savages, not modern, not, they need to be saved, right? The classic, um, the native that needs to be saved and made made whole. And so just hearing that, I thought, you know, I, it helped me in so many ways center myself around how, how different my experience was from them, how privileged I was, how though I've had my challenges, my connection to Tibetan, to Tibetan culture and strength and spirituality is a gift to be cherished and on my terms to be grown and, and, um, embraced thank you all once again so much for sharing yourselves with us uh so openly and so unapologetically uh and you know i also am torn in this space where we are celebrating an identity asian pacific islander and native hawaiian um, that is politicized onto us um, and what it means that um, we come together for an identity that um, as lydia shared like is historically marginalized identity yet i am also so grateful for the spirituality and the sacredness that is this space with all of you um, i'm really humbled um, to be here the final question that we have for all of you, um, and if we do have a little bit more time, then perhaps we will field some audience questions, but once again, apologies for just the sake of time, um, will be on celebration and uh, sustaining healing. Um, and so the question is, how do you sustain your activism and healing, and how do you celebrate? Once again, the question was, how do you sustain your activism and healing, and how do you celebrate? And any one of you can please start us off. <clears throat> Have as keen a sense of 
a spiritual side to our existence whereby we can turn to it, run to it, acknowledge it, embrace it, where we can allow it to shelter us. And when I say that, <clears throat> I mean, uh, through an example of what I do, right now I am Kumuhina speaking to you on this panel of associates that have much in common with one another in terms of our cumulative experiences. However, in my personal circles, I get to take off the designation of Kumu. I get to I get to step away from having responsibility because Kumu um, in my language means either a teacher or a resource or it, it means someone that has that uh, that responsibility. I am now very clear in having just turned 49 uh, this weekend. Um, I am very clear about when I wish to wear the designation of a responsibility bearer for, to be acknowledged as Kumu. And when I don't want people to put me in that in that light i um they will address me as such and i must stop them and say no kumu is off the clock thank you very much this is hinale moana i am fallible i am fragile sometimes i sometimes i want to be fragile and frail not too often um but you know i with that said spiritually i have already put a slight veil up so that when I don't want people to come and be needy upon me and when I don't want to be approached and when I don't want to engage with the rest of the world, I'm already in this mode mentally and spiritually and emotionally. And I literally, you can call it meditation if you want, you can call it prayer if you want, but it is that self reaffirmation internally saying, I need to shut off the, from the rest of the world. There are physical things that I do to um, physically move myself into a different mental and emotional space and place. But in the most simplest terms, I don't know if what I'm sharing might help anyone here on this panel or any of the other attendees, but we must literally acknowledge that it is time for us to rest and it is time for our spirit to take a break because we're only able to shoulder so much in this lifetime. As someone who has experienced a great loss in this last year, in 2020, that loss is so profound to me, but even in the afterlife, he is still with me and continues to look after me, protect me, and guide me. And continues to show up when I need him the most. So, I can only say to you all that we must be keenly aware of when those whom have gone on before us. If we do, if we commit to the things that we avail ourselves to, and if we allow ourselves to light the fire for others and to be the fire for others, if we allow ourselves to serve in some kind of way, to be a catalyst of change, we must acknowledge and we must embrace that there is a human side to us that supersedes gender and our articulation expression of ourselves. It supersedes all of the physical. It takes us to a spiritual, mental, and emotional place. And we must know how to navigate the way there and navigate the way back so that we can disconnect for a short time. 
so that we can avoid the overload in our circuitry so that we can process what the world has given us to digest and it's like taking our smart device and rebooting it you have to power down and turn it back on or you have to update it you have and when you update you know it's the little update's going to go like this but we need to allow ourselves to physically mentally emotionally spiritually do that in whatever way that comes out for us so i leave that with you all today as my thought for that some things that help me reboot and hard reset are connecting with community and sometimes that looks like shutting off my brain and going to game night with some friends where we i learned how to play mahjong and i've never learned how to play that before and it is really hard if anyone has never played it before um having relationships that have deep emotional connections are things that bring me back and shut me down in good ways having hobbies outside of my paid labor are really important to remind me that i'm just a human person and also having an identity outside of work making sure that i have plenty of places where i can take that identity and mask off this is lydia there are a couple of things that come to mind one is I spent a lot of time cultivating and building relationships that are not centered on or only about doing organizing or activism. And that is critical. Most, not all, but most of my close friends are not deeply involved in activism or organizing. That wasn't intentional, right? Like I'm not setting out in life to either be like, I will only be friends with organizers or I will never be friends with organizers. But that's what's happened. And that's been very grounding for me. That even though the vast majority of my friends, as you might expect, share most or all of the same kinds of values that I do. Otherwise, it could be very difficult, you know, to be friends if one person is like, I don't actually believe in, you know, your humanity. Like, why, why are you friends with that person? You shouldn't be. But they aren't necessarily involved in activism or organizing, or if they are, they're often doing organizing in very different spaces than I'm doing organizing in. And I found that to be very critical for setting and maintaining boundaries around my own energy, around my emotional processing, and around my life. Because I will, there's never a point in my day in which I stop being who I am. There's not a point in my life in which I stop agitating for, for liberation and for justice. There's never a moment where I don't care about justice. And at the same time, it is vital for us, especially as marginalized folks, not to create an entire identity out of being marginalized or out of activism. Because if that as a concept becomes our entire identity and sense of self, we will lose ourselves. It is both important to be grounded in and rooted in our communities, in ancestry, in teachings of our elders, in the work that we do, and the vision of the next world that we are organizing and building toward, and that we cultivate joy and pleasure that isn't just about organizing and activism. And we cultivate joy and pleasure outside of our organizing and activism work. For me, that's often been in admiring people's kitties and doggos. Uh, I put a number in the chat, please do use it. Send me pictures of cats and dogs, please send them. I want them, thank you. It has also come in eating and enjoying good food and in making food. I cook and I bake and I love especially to cook and bake for other people. When other people love something that I have made, that gives me great joy. And it makes me so excited. If someone is like, oh my God, this is so good. I'm like, really? Tell me more about how good it was. Also, I'm a Leo, obviously. And 
I love to, too, to learn about what things give other people joy also. And I mentioned I write fiction and that fiction writing and tabletop and online text-based role-playing is also a source of a lot of joy and pleasure for me and always has been. Yeah, I think it really resonated with me, um, the spiritual connection that can center and ground us to continue to do the work, but also to be, um, to, I find it's been, I, I've had a, though growing up surrounded with Tibetan Buddhist symbols and my father doing his spiritual practice all the time, every day, the lighting of incense, the, um, prostrations, the prayers, I would hear always from his room, the sound of different great teachers on tape, he would listen to the tapes as he struggled through hard times in his life. Um, as a political exile, you know, very removed from his people and the heart of his, um, his world, really. He would I, would, I would listen to, you know, the sounds coming from his room and know that that's what he was doing, though it wasn't as clear to me then as it is now that he was connecting with the teachings. Um, and even though he, you know, to many people that knew him, he's a very progressive, open, you know, fun-loving um, person, he was actually, he is actually deeply uh, spiritual too. And that, that I love that I could see both of those, um, sides of him growing up in our home. And after my, uh, you know, I did 15 years of pretty intense organizing and going to, um, China and sort of facing one of my deepest fears with going into what is a beautiful country and getting a chance for a short time to, be close to people that I'm, there's, you know, technically I'm supposed to be this other and they're supposed to be my enemy by someone's idea, but they're not. And I got a brief moment, very scary, but brief moment in, in Beijing in the lead up to the last Olympic games. Um, I was detained, interrogated, deported and all of that um, energy and stress and exhilaration and tension and coming so close to this place in my mind that was very, very, very like full of fear. I just, the whole Olympics campaign, um, we did a banner on Mount Everest. We did a banner on the Great Wall of China. Lots of people put themselves in harm's way for, to speak Tibetans truth at that moment. And it was very stressful. And I really look now, can look back and say how many years I think it took me to recover from that. Um, and I always go back to family and actually t Tibetans are, I think anybody who's ever come in contact with Tibetan culture and community, it's just like this crazy thing where it's the most, the saddest, most intense and awful stories, but of people that are so like, know how to have a good time and know how to party and know how to embrace life. I think a lot because of Buddhism, um, there's this strength that we, my, my very good friend and uh, someone who has taken care of my son, my older son for many years uh, is Ngala Sangdol. She was a, uh, a nun in Tibet and she was in prison from the time she was 12. Uh, 13 until uh, 20, I forget exactly, 24, 26. And she now lives here in Massachusetts and near our house and has looked after my son and um, people that meet her, our friends in the neighborhood after, you know, have known her for a year or more, then find out her story of being in the most notorious prison political for political prisoners in Tibet at such a young and tender age. And she is the most incredibly grounded, joyous person and spirit. And 
I know she was in prison with her father for a lot of that time, though he was in the men's section and she was in the women's section and he died shortly after they, they never got to be together again. But her strength comes from her spiritual belief and practice, which is still so strong. And from her, I've learned so much. And when my first child died, I learned how close I was in my like essence to the teachings, but I never quite somehow grasped them, I feel like, until all of this sort of stress, almost PTSD after the Olympics and coming here and having um, a beautiful baby that did not live and then facing all the suffering in Tibet and thinking of what is my suffering compared to this, you know, suffering and how much do I know about suffering and life and all of this I feel like um, doesn't have to be like the strict letter of religious teachings but the reading a certain am amount of teachings about this life and impermanence and the interconnectedness of all of us and that this is just this body we live in in this in this life but there are many to come and there have been many before all of that helps me uh, re orient myself to what matters in the day what matters in the week how how precious this all is and how um in it, all of it we have to take care of ourselves and the people around us and i can't be a bulldozer over myself or over other people when i think we need to do this this just to to breathe and to take it more life a little more slowly but also to work consistently just with that determination that I see inside Tibet all that time. Wow. Um, I'm sitting here processing and I probably will after this event um, as we come to a closure um, and as we are all resting our spirits, I hope that um, you all as audience members and panelists, just like myself, are thinking about resting not just my own spirit, but the spirits of those um, who come and go before me and my ancestors. Um, so thank you so much for those wisdoms and imparting that on all of us. Um, Wanishi, which is Lenape for thank you um, once again um, for all of you to be able to bring this space together um, for panelists, um, for Columbia School of Social Work, and um, our audience members who are here today. Uh, this event will be fully captioned and uploaded to our DEI media archives. Um, and if you have any feedback or any um, questions or concerns for us, please do let us know um, in the links that uh, Dean Lowe has put in our chat box, bit.ly slash DEI feedback, all in caps, or contact us at swdei at columbia.edu. Once again, thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed day, evening, wherever you may be.